would be the Cowboys favorite song because it has so much to do with, you know, it has livestock, it has to do with the shepherd, it has to do with God taking care of us. It brings a lot of great analogies in that. The Cowboys favorite song. And it's a mighty song because, think about it, it was written a thousand years before Christ came. And it's actually talking about Christ taking care of sheep, isn't it? Now, I want you to think about it. He says so much in five words. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He is saying that we can have a relationship with the ultimate. Amen? We can be intimate with the ultimate. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, people who write paragraphs, pages, books, and even volumes about who God is. <laughs> I like simple things, don't you? Yep. Cowboys like simple things. The psalmist summed it up in five words who God is. The Lord is my shepherd. And you think about the psalmist. A thousand years before Christ died, David penned those words. How many of us, through the years and before us, have gone to take a drink, a refreshing drink, <coughs> at the brook called Psalm 23. Oh, man, we've all refreshed there, haven't we? There's so much there. And the psalmist wrote those words when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you ever counted the words in Psalm 23, there's 118 of them. Isn't it, isn't it really something that the last 116 words describe the first two words, the Lord? But think about that. When you look at the title he gives God, he says the Lord. In, in the Hebrew language, when he uses the word Lord, Adonai, He's using a God that rolls up his sleeves and is ready to work. <laughs> He's talking about the majesty of God when he says the Lord. But he's talking about the mercy of God when he says, is my shepherd. He's talking about the triumph of God when he says the Lord. But he's talking about the tenderness of God when he says my shepherd. Think about this. When he says the Lord, he's talking about the power of God. Boy, he's powerful. Amen? Amen. But when he says my shepherd, he's talking about the, how God is personal. The greatness of God, the Lord, but the grace of God, my shepherd. When I take all that. You know, Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And he is sympathetic <laughs> For us in everything that we've gone through. That's so when I think of that phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, I think of Hebrews chapter 2. As I think about this beautiful song, I think about four things that he takes care of, that he supplies. Four different areas in our life he supplies. I want you to look at these four. It's not going to take us long. I'm going to say what uh, Elizabeth Taylor said to her seven husbands. I'm not, I'm not going to keep you long, okay? <laughs> Four things. Number one, God is going to take care of the simplistic needs of our life. Now think about those, that, verse two. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's verse one, verse two. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, verse three. He, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Christ, our shepherd, takes care of the simplistic needs of our life. 
He took care of the sheep. Grass, water, took care of all their needs. They didn't have any other needs. He says, Jesus, the Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. It's all taken care of. Amen? Amen. He takes care of your simplistic needs. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, in the Sermon on the Mount, it talks about, from verse 25 to 34, about taking care of our needs. And in verse 25 and verse 31 and verse 34, it says, Do not be anxious. Some translation says, Do not worry. It says it three times. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Now, think about this. He talks about don't be, don't worry. Because you know the word worry, anxious, you know what that means? It means to divide your thinking. See, our thinking should be a faith, right? But when you start worrying, you've added something to the composition called doubt. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? See, you have divided your faith. Do not worry. Matthew 6, 25, 31, 34. Do not worry. <clears throat> now, he uses the analogy of the birds. He takes care of the birds, doesn't he? I mean, birds don't have a warehouse. They don't have a storehouse. <laughs> they live one day at a time, amen? They tell us there's 25 birds for every human being. That's a lot of birds, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that he'll attend the funeral service of a bird? <laughs> he knows every time a bird dies. <laughs> if he can take care of the bird, he can take care of you. Because in another place, in Matthew, he says, you know, you're more valuable than the sparrow, right? He knows when a sparrow's fallen, right? He knows when a, a sparrow dies. He's going to take care of every need that you have. Every need. So get it in your bird brain. He's going to take care of you. <laughs> Do not worry. Do not be anxious. What does Paul say in jail? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication, make your request be made up to God, and he will guard your heart with peace. <coughs> Aiden Rogers takes that passage of Scripture, and he says, you know, three things we're not supposed to worry about. Food. Take no thought of what you're going to eat. That's what it says in verse 25. And here's something, ladies. Take no thought of what you're going to wear. <laughs> Not only food, but fashion, right? He says those birds, if they know they have a father, that's going to take care of them. Amen? Amen. Amen. He talks about in that passage, the flowers of the field. He dresses them. You know, they can't go out and get the food. God gives them room service. <laughs> <laughs> he, he brings them the water. And he brings them the nourishment. So you have fashion. Take no thought of what you're supposed to wear. And then you have the future. Because in verse 34 it says live one day at a time. Amen. Most of your worries are either the rearview mirror. Or the tomorrow. Or the next week. Next month. We're all supposed to live one day at a time. Right? Simplistic needs. I, I, I think of that verse that says, in, in the psalm, he says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. That word restore is where we get our word restaurant. He restores our <coughs> soul. The shepherd takes care of the simplistic needs of your life. Let him do that. That's what Peter said. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon who? Him. For he cares for you. The word cast is in the aorist tense. It means once and for all. Cast it. Release it. I can read in one translation of this. says throw it. <laughs> throw all your cares upon Christ. He's going to catch them. Amen? Amen. 
He's not going to throw them back. He's going to take care. So, the shepherd takes care of the simplistic needs of your life. And then, the shepherd takes care of the sorrowful needs of your life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This man did a beautiful song. If I'm the first to go, let, let me be the first to go. What's that the name of it? But here's the thing, folks. We all are going to have sorrow. If sorrow comes, but we have someone that's going to help us in the sorrow. He's going to help us with the sorrowful needs. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death. Now, we're never going to have to, as a believer, really get touched by death. We just get touched by the shadow. Christ has already been touched by the death. Amen? Amen. And it says two things there that really help me. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod. That's the word of God. Boy, aren't you glad to have the Bible? Amen. Aren't you glad the Bible is the inspired word of God? Amen. From one cover to the other cover. I even think the, the part of the concordance is inspired. It's all inspired. Amen. But it gives us comfort that I can read in the Bible that Jesus said this, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. Yeah. I can read all those verses. It says, The rod and the staff. Well, the staff's the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. It says, Thy word, that's the rod and my staff, they comfort me. And that's an interesting word, comfort. Because in the New Testament, it is the word for the Holy Spirit, comforter. Jesus uses that in John 14, 15, and 16. The word comforter comes from two words, parakaleo. It means to walk along beside you. If that person does go before you, you've got the Holy Spirit to walk with you. Amen? Amen? Oh, that's great. That's enough to make a dead man shout. Amen? <laughs> He's going to take care of the spiritual needs. I am glad that Christ never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We're going through the valley. But we're only to be touched by the shadow. He takes care of the simplistic needs. He takes care of the sorrowful needs. Then he takes care of the social needs. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then he says... He anoints my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Now I want you to think about the uh, social needs that we have in life. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemy. Christ wants to have fellowship with us. And the best way you can have fellowship is at the table. I mean, you want to get to know somebody? Sit down with them to eat. I mean, it goes back, way back in David's time, and in our time. The best fellowship we can have is sitting at that table and eat. And the shepherd is saying, I want to have fellowship with you. I want to sit at the table with you. I want to have fellowship with you. Spend some time fellowshipping with the Lord. Eat from his table, the Lord of God. Amen? Amen. Fellowship with him. Fellowship with him. But then that phrase, he anoints my head with oil. He anoints my head with oil. In David's time, and went all the way back to Jesus' time, uh, if you uh, came to a house, and you came in as a visitor, they had uh, some perfume, some oil, and they would take that and splash it on him. That means we're glad to have you. Thanks for coming. I splash that old one. That perfume one. Glad to have you. Thanks for coming to my house. That's what Jesus does to us when we talk to him. Amen. Splashes us with his power. The oil. Splashes us with his fragrance. 
Of course, there's some people that come in your home. Boy, you can't wait till they leave. <laughs> I mean, they're talking about everybody, letting you know up on the the the, the, uh, the newest gossip. You want to splash them on the way out. <laughs> But when we have fellowship with the Lord, He wants to anoint us with oil. Isn't that great? He prepares a table before us. He anoints our head with oil. I like this part. And my cup runs over. You ever thought about that? If you go back to the, the uh, culture, the time of David, all through Jesus Christ, my cup runs over. You know, in those days, they did not have a place for you to stay if you were traveling. They didn't have the Hampton Inn. They didn't have the Holiday Inn. They didn't have uh, all these nice hotels, Marriott's. They didn't have La Quinta. By the way, do you know what La Quinta means? It means next to Denny's. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have all that. And you know what? They didn't have all the restaurants. They didn't have the the Golden Archers did. <coughs> they didn't have all these restaurants. Chili's. What have you. So in the book of Leviticus, if you read about it, the, the, the law it said that if you were traveling, you could go in somebody's door and knock on the door. And you could eat a meal there. Get a little rest. Well, that nice. I mean, that was a law. You had to bring them in. You had to feed them. Take care of them. Didn't even know them. They're strangers. They come in your house, anoint them with oil. You set them at the table. Now, if they filled your cup and it was overflowing, that meant, hey, stay a little longer. We enjoy your company. We enjoy your fellowship. We're having a good time here. Amen. If they only filled it half full, that was a message. As soon as the dessert's over, hit the road. <laughs> this is not fun. You need to go. <laughs> but isn't it nice when we sit at the master's table, have fellowship with him, he anoints us with oil, and he takes our cup, fills it up, overflowing. Let me ask you something. Is your cup full this morning? Is your cup of hope full? Your cup of hope should be full and overflowing. Amen? Amen. Your cup of joy should be full and overflowing. Amen. Your cup of love Come on. should be full and overflowing. Right. I worked for a pastor right out of college. Dr. Bill Crouch. I was his youth pastor of Grace Temple Baptist Church in Dallas. It's a large church. And I remember several things that Brother Crouch would say. And he had a full head of hair. He'd tell a joke. And he loved it. I love to hear Dr. Crouch tell jokes because I love to hear him laugh at his own jokes. He'd, go, <laughs> he'd, 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 he'd shake that head and this big chin. Every once in a while in his sermon, he'd say, Is your cup full? Is your cup full? I hope your cup's full. He takes care of the simplicity. He takes care of the sorrowful. He takes care of the social. And the last thing, he takes care of the spiritual needs. We get down to that last verse. And that is shouting men's, shouting women's territory. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Life is a, has a competition, a composition of two things. Time and eternity. Doesn't it? Uh, well, I don't know if I have tomorrow. You don't know if you have tomorrow. What is your life? It's but a vapor. It appears for a little and then it will vanish away. <clears throat> only what, uh, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for one, Christ will last. 
time and eternity. First of all, he deals with time while we're on this earth. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's time. That's time. There was a little boy. He was growing up too fast. He was in second grade. His name was Timmy. And he's tired of his mother walking him to school. And he wanted to walk to school with his friend. He said, I'm a big boy. I want to walk to school with my friend. Mom, I don't want you walking with me to school. It's just like three blocks. So she had a lady across the street that had a preschool. The lady's name was Shirley Goodness. And she had a daughter named Marcy. And she says, would you watch my son and his friend and kind of walk? He walk at the same time every morning. Free walk. Could you walk behind him and make sure they get to school? She said, I'd be glad to. This went on for a week, and little Timmy, his friend, said, who is that woman and her daughter that keeps following us? He says, well, all I know is every night before I go to bed, my mom reads the 23rd Psalm. And that last verse says, surely goodness and her daughter Mercy, Mercy, will follow me all the days of my life. That's the of the story, but it's actually the truth. Amen? God's grace and mercy are walking all around you. And they're there for you every day of your life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's time. Here's eternity. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we leave here, you know Christ, you're in heaven. Isn't that great? That's wonderful. No all of all lay in heaven, ladies. Angel Martinez used to say, everyone's going to be 33 in heaven. <laughs> and the ladies say, amen. <laughs> no more pain. No more sorrow. The former things are passed away. Only glory <coughs> by and by. He takes care of the simplicity. He takes care of the sorrow. He takes care of the social. He takes care of the spiritual. By making Christ your shepherd. My shepherd. My shepherd. My shepherd. My shepherd. Can you say that Jesus Christ is your shepherd? If you can't, you need to make him your shepherd. Amen. Amen. He says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise what? Cast out. You come to Jesus, he receives you. <clears throat> if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be what? Say. Philippian jailer asked, Paul and Silas the question, what must I do to be saved? Paul gave a profound answer. He said, join the Baptist church and you shall be saved. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> be baptized and you shall be saved. He didn't say that either, did he? What did he say? He said, believe on the what? Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved shall be saved. Oh, isn't that wonderful? That I can say the Lord is my shepherd. You can say the Lord is my shepherd. If you haven't accepted Christ, we've got uh, some green sheets out in the back or, or right here or whatever. Right here. And we'd like for you to fill them out. If you've accepted Christ, your personal Savior today. Because we're going to say a prayer. You just call on the name of the Lord. You'll be saved. You believe in Him, what He's done. He died on the cross for you. He rose again. If you pray and ask Christ to come in your heart, He's going to do what He says He's going to do. Amen? Amen. He says, we're two or more are gathered. I'm in the midst. He's right here. Amen. So 
So why don't you bow your heads and do something I did many years ago. I just invited Christ to come in to be my Savior. Why don't you do that? Say this prayer. My Father God, I pray and receive Christ as my Savior. By faith, I receive Him as Savior. By faith, I receive Him as my living shepherd. By faith, I ask Him to forgive my sins. By faith, I receive the gift of salvation. I receive the gift of heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, here's what Jesus said about what you just did. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me, John 6, 47, He that believes on me will have everlasting life. When he said, Verily, verily, that's the strongest terms he could have used. Certainly, certainly, it happened. It's like these texts, when they, they they'll say, Sure enough, sure enough. <laughs> it happened. So if you accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you want to tell people, right? One of the ways you tell them the cowboy church, you fill out that, that form and then put it in a bucket where they offer me. <laughs> tell the preacher. Get some help so you can grow in Christ. It's been good to be with you today. Thank you for your support of Texas Baptist. As we start a new church. We've got a pastor here to start a new church in Fort Worth, Cowtown Cowboy Church, Sonny Miller. And he's got some folks here. He's got his wife. And folks here, we're glad to have them. Amen. They're starting out. And we pray for them. And, uh, amazing thing. We started the Cowboy Church in Amarillo. I knew when and the, preacher, the preacher's name is uh, Bob Miller. And then we started this one. It was approved for funding last month. And, and the pastor's name is Sonny Miller. <laughs> and then it looks like next month we're going to have another church approved in Azle, Texas. You know, believe this. The guy's name is Kurt Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Millerites. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's an amazing thing. Like that's something you, you you know as part of being the Cowboy Church. Well, uh, happy trails to you and watch out where you're stepping, okay? Amen? Amen. 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 We've got Kent to give us our Cowboy Club. I was wrestling with the poem that I had picked out. I just couldn't get the rhyme down right. So Terry influenced me to do this one. When he said that he's gone from bad to worse, <laughs> I thought of this poem and I happened to have it. I've done it before, so y'all that's heard it Bear with me. Now my wife just left and the well went dry. And my horse is sick and about to die. Then my steel blew up and the barn burned down. And the road washed out on the way to town. Then my dog got rabies and bit the cat. And they both died soon after that. Now I lost my specs and my pipe stem broke. So I can't even sit and read and smoke. Then a tree fell on the chicken shed and most of the hens got smashed plum dead. Then a chimney fire took half of a wall, and this old shack is about to fall. Then I caught my heel on an old dead vine, and sat smack dab on a porcupine. <laughs> then a beaver dam broke, and my bridge washed out. And my watch stopped working, and I got the gout. And the bank foreclosed, so I lost my place, and my cow disappeared without a trace. They cut off my credit at the grocery store, and I lost my job and a whole lot more. I must have been hexed by a triple curse as things keep going from bad to worse. And now faith has hit me one last dirty crack to top off the worst. My wife's coming back. <laughs>